Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, How to Negotiate with Terrorists and Bring Hostages Home, with Ori Slonim and Dan Raviv. Following the program, please visit Moment's website, where you can register for our upcoming programs and read articles posted by our editorial team at momentmag.com. Now for today's program. Moment contributor Dan Raviv was a CBS News correspondent in Israel, Europe, and Washington for 40 years, and then senior DC correspondent for Israel's I-24 News. Dan is the author of books about Israeli espionage and diplomacy, including Spies Against Armageddon and Every Spy a Prince. Ori Slonim is from a seventh-generation family that had lived in Hebron, though he grew up in the Tel Aviv area, and became a successful private lawyer. Prior to college and law school, Ori entered the Israel Defense Forces and became a parachuter and was promoted to major as a parachuting instructor. In 1974, he and his wife Tammy were injured, injured in a deadly terrorist attack in a Tel Aviv cinema when a bomb planted by a terrorist was detonated. Though Ori and Tammy recovered, others did not. In 1986, Israeli President Chaim Herzog, who was well acquainted with Ori, came up with the idea of appointing him as special counsel to the defense minister for issues of POWs and MIAs, concentrating first and foremost on relations with families. In 1988, Ori received the Standard of Defense Minister's Council and High Security Clarification and gained senior cooperation with the Mossad. For the next 36 years, Ori searched throughout the world for those young IDF soldiers, pilots, and reservists who were captured in battles with terrorist organizations but were never heard from. His mission to find the missing boys, all in their teens or 20s, took him all over the world to meeting in nations that did not recognize Israel and meetings with ruthless terrorist representatives. At the same time, he always kept his duty to the families that the state of Israel would do all it could to bring their loved ones home. Ori has received many awards by the state of Israel for his unparalleled dedication to the country. Ori is the author of the book, A Knock at the Door, the story of my secret work with Israeli MIAs and POWs. Please welcome Ori Slonim and Dan Raviv. Suzanne, thank you very much. And Ori Slonim in Israel, we thank you for, for, for sparing some of your time because a worldwide audience of Moment Magazine really wants to know what's going on. Is there any progress? 239 hostages kidnapped by Hamas. They disappeared into Gaza. And and, and from that introduction, including mention uh, of, of your fine book, uh, A Knock at the Door, sorry if that's not in focus, it, it will be later, I promise. A Knock at the Door, your memoir of your work uh, to negotiate with terrorist organizations, indirectly in general, to get uh, MIAs uh, found, released, sometimes people's bodies, you're still at it. I know now you're a very senior advisor helping the families of the kidnapped in Israel who are having demonstrations, gatherings every day in Tel Aviv. They marched to Jerusalem. So what's happening now? What do you and the families hear? Is there progress? Will there be some releases? Uh, I think that uh, in such a delicate matter, things uh, are not being released until the last moment. And for the time being, uh, uh, as for myself, I know that there, there are some negotiations, there are some discussions in Qatar with the head of uh, the Israeli Mossad, Dadi Barnea, and the representative of uh, of the Hamas and the representative of uh, the Egyptian and also the people of uh, the US who uh, also have uh, some representative in the in the kidnapping uh, group. So uh, nobody, nobody I believe except those who are dealing directly with the negotiation knows now what's going and there is no any agreement until now uh, they are talking about uh, about uh, a technique that uh, talking about uh, releasing in uh, in certain uh, in certain pieces it means first uh, first chapter a couple of uh, children a couple of old uh, old men a couple of uh, of their mothers i don't know if it is accurately but this is the the what's what's going on and uh, and then having a, a very short pause 
in the war, which can be three days or five days, and then the second pause that nobody knows what will happen. I, in person, I, in person, I have a, a very extreme uh, opinion that the whole uh, issue should be dealt in one piece, one piece and one uh, one uh, re one release of each side. I'm very afraid of uh, this uh, cutting it into you know chapters because in any chapter especially the Hamas, they can say the war is too cruel, uh, we have problems, we don't have electricity, whatever, and then to delay and delay. And the torture of this family is something which uh, I, I, I think nobody in the world can, can understand it. Their loved ones disappeared on October 7th. And it's not all Israelis. Um, it's an international group uh, of hostages and some non-Israeli governments are monitoring the talks. Obviously, they want to hear good news. And the United States is heavily involved. The White House says uh, that as many as nine or 10 U.S. citizens are in the group, um, you've heard there might be more who actually hold U.S. passports. Uh, but overall, um, or especially compared with your work over the decades, where it was Israel trying to find and release a few Israelis, never a group this big. This time, a lot of nations concerned. And this number, I mean, what what, what number of, of hostages or MIAs did you ever have to deal with in all your work since the mid 80s? How many people did you used to have to negotiate for? I dealt, I dealt with the groups of uh, MIAs and uh, POWs from uh, 1986 uh, until uh, Gilad Shalit was released after after being jailed in, in Gaza for five years in a small uh, cell uh, without uh, meeting any human being for most of the five years. And uh, he even didn't meet his uh, guards. Uh, he got his food under the door, something which was very cruel. And uh, from that uh, time, uh, I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have any, uh, uh, anything else until October 7, when uh, the number uh, the number is, as you know, 240, 239, depends on, on the day, uh, which were, which have been taken to captivity in a very cruel way on October 7. Nobody of them was uh, armed. It was babies, it was families, it was uh, uh, pregnant women, it was some girls who went to dance in a festival in the desert. Um, and uh, they also were caught by the Hamas, uh, by the Hamas people. Some of them were raped in public uh, upon their uh, coming to the, to the place they, they were hidden in, in there. Uh, they were old people who uh, used the uh, oxygen equipment. There were, there were babies that uh, didn't have their uh, food. There were people that didn't have for uh, uh, the whole time until today their medicine. Can you imagine people uh, above 50, above 60 start to take some medicine and they didn't have it? And um, there are some uh, some video clips, very cruel ones, that uh, you know the state of Israel uh, at the first uh, first stage well, didn't want to show it to the world because it was like uh, uh, the the ugliest. The ugliest uh, uh, porno, porno uh, clips with people uh, that their head was cut and raping in public. And uh, I saw part of it, uh, part of our member of Knesset saw it, and some of them cried. Some, uh, I believe, uh, one, one was uh, close to faint. And this is the whole thing that uh, never occurred, I believe, in any other country in the world. Now, uh, from, uh, from that uh, day, um, the IDF started uh, the war against the Hamas. It's not a war against Gaza. It's a war against the Hamas, who is, uh, I think, it's it's not close to ISIS. It's much more cruel than ISIS, if you can imagine, if you remember. So this is the situation, and uh, on top of uh, of all all uh, ugly ugly behavior, not ugly. It was crime against humanity. It was felony against humanity. It was murder of, 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 of a nation. And uh, we are now in this situation 
Now, the people, I believe the people in Israel, uh, they're strong and the army is strong. But uh, having such a such an uh, opponent in the other side, which you never can predict what he's going to do. Nowadays, the, the, the army enter into Gaza and they found that all the headquarters of Hamas was under hospitals. So they had hospitals above their, their uh, headquarters. Uh, they, brought the, they brought to these uh, places uh, ammunition, bombs, whatever. And we discovered it now within the within the fighting. Well, Ori, we'll we'll get back to what Israel is doing, rolling into Gaza, determined to overthrow the Hamas government and make it impossible for Hamas ever to be the governors. And then, of course, that question as to what would happen next. We'll, we'll get to that. But let me stay with your expertise in hostage negotiation. As we're recording this on the evening of November 16th, Middle East time, there are reports that that a deal uh, brokered apparently in Qatar uh, is close, uh, in which only some hostages would be released. Uh, as you discussed, it might be children and women, not men, perhaps. I know it's a Jewish nightmare to think that there would be a selectia, a selection that reminds Jews, quite rightly, of the kind of selectia that the Nazis would do in, in concentration camps and death camps, and Jews don't want to be subject to that again. But what can you do, right? You're, you, you favor releasing everyone at once, meaning Israel should give whatever it can, which means Israel might even have to almost empty the prisons. 1,000, 1,000 Palestinians, mostly convicted or arrested for terrorism, were released just for that one soldier you mentioned, Gilad Shalit. So thousands of prisoners should be released because you're close to the families. I guess you'd favor that, and in general, they would. Um, I, I think that even in uh, even at the Shalit uh, exchange, and also now, uh, I, I don't care of releasing prisoners, and if they are coming back to terror, they they should be killed. It's it's very simple. Now we are releasing uh, we are releasing in our civil uh, uh, system people who murder people, people who rape people after two thirds of their uh, punishment, and then they are uh, on uh, on uh, you know they are on condition that if they will repeat it, they will come back to 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 their jails. Uh, when you are talking about terrorists, the only thing is. To tell them and to even to to have a document, a, a legal document that the whole world we know it. That then we, when they come back to their to their homeland or their country, whatever, uh, if they are coming back to terror, uh, it's a death uh, sentence. Well, you're admitting they might return to terrorism, but again, no, they're not, they, not all of them, but some of them. Yeah, yeah, but again, because of your sensitivity to the families, and I think what you consider it's clear from your book, a knock at the door that you consider it a holy duty on the part of Israel's government and leadership to the families of soldiers, to the families of kidnapped people, that you have to put their fate and welfare first. You know, there is, uh, in democratic uh, countries like Israel, like, like the U.S., of course, there is, a, there is a, an agreement between the, the individual and his government, his country, he's paying taxes, he's, he's obeying the, the law, whatever. And the country, when the country sends him to, to war, to defend its uh, citizen, uh, this agreement say they have to bring him back. This is part of the agreement. It's a civil agreement. It's a, it's a moral agreement. The same in Israel. In Israel, you know, uh, army service, Army service is for three years for men and two or two and a half for, for women. And when they go to war, they can be injured, they can be killed, and they can be uh, being in the in, in hostage or, or being a prisoner of war. So the agreement says you have to bring them back. And this is a democratic agreement. It's, it, it doesn't exist in a terror organization. So we are not equal. They don't have laws. They don't have treaties. They don't have uh, 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 government and coalition, all these uh, things. 
And you have a government, you have a parliament, the Knesset, you have treaties, international treaties. So we, it's, it's not a, you know, we are very strong. I'm, I'm not complaining, but we are acting uh, according to the law. And uh, a terror group is not acting according to any law. Only the law of, uh, you know, trying to, trying to practice their, their, their goals. A law of barbaric behavior for sure. Now, you, you confronted this face to face in your work since the mid 1980s. You write about it in, in your memoir, A Knock at the Door. You're, you're still at it. So when I, when I hear that there are indirect negotiations, let's say in Qatar, some of it might be in Cairo, Egypt as well. But let's say it's in Qatar, uh, in Qatar. We hear that the United States is involved with diplomats and specialists on this subject. The CIA is involved, obviously trying to gather information also about where the hostages are. And as you said, Dedi Barnea, the head of the Mossad, has been in Qatar. The former head, Yossi Cohen, was there. A little controversy within Israel as to who might be stepping on someone else's turf. But that's not what's important. Um, is it true that an Israeli would never be in the same room, even as a political chief of Hamas. People like their prime minister, Hania, are very frequently in Doha, Qatar. I mean, what? how does it really work? Is Are there three rooms, you know, one for the mediators and one for the terrorist group and one for Israel? I mean, how, how does that work? You, you've been there. Uh, I think that you can use your imagination to uh, for that uh, episode, either of sitting in uh, in different rooms or or coming uh, coming from time to time to the country to, to uh, talking with others or to use an intermediate like we use uh, a lot uh, intermediates from Germany from uh, England uh, never America uh, but usually people who uh, were were serving in the, in their uh, uh, intelligence in the, in their Mossad, like the German one. Uh, I can tell you that uh, there were also uh, direct negotiation once that I took. Uh, I took. I, I was part of it when we uh, we released the body of a Druze uh, a Druze prisoner of war who was killed uh, while he was there, and then we sat directly with the terrorist. I can tell you that I, I met. Um, from time to time, I met uh, people or relative of, of these people who are actually terrorists, and we talk like like I talk with you, uh, because uh, you have to you have to understand that sometimes the best way is to talk directly, but most of the time you have to do it uh, via uh, inter intermediate people or people who are uh, in between. Nowadays, the Qatars and the Egyptian. And uh, which are ba based uh, coming from time to time to Qatar, but the technique is usually with somebody who can, uh, you know, jump from side to side and uh, and negotiate with uh, such uh, very uh, very uh, I think very unusual uh, negotiation, not like business negotiation. Yeah, yeah, and you've you've taken part in in all of the above business negotiation. You're a successful private attorney in Israel. And then this very special work, which you did basically as a volunteer for Israel's government. I know you're right in your book. You, you took a, a salary, so to speak, of one shekel a year, you know, less than a dollar um, and, and, and gave of your time, found some satisfaction in helping so many families, even if they only found out that someone had died. And frankly, of course, that may be the answer again. Just I think uh, I think that uh, I think I, I, I think that there are uh, Many uh, justifications for uh, for an individual uh, to do things uh, for others. Uh, I think that life has no no value, no meaning when you don't do things for others. Uh, I met once one of uh, one of Israel a volunteer. He was a very famous one, and I asked him uh, how uh, how do can afford it? You know, to to volunteer and uh, all these things. I was also part of. Uh, the, the, the largest uh, children charity in Israel for 30 years and even in the US. And uh, he said, look, uh, I'm not doing anything to others. I'm an egoist. I'm doing it to myself. Because for himself you know, and his, 
his satisfaction, which you're saying you you got as well. I know that organization is the Variety Club that helps children. So you did it for your own satisfaction. Uh, can I draw you back to that kind of painful point I was moving toward as delicately as I could? You probably expect that you will be with the families in Israel when some or many of them get bad news about their loved ones. Yes, uh, you know, part of part of this, uh, of the whole story is, uh, you know, 90% bad and 10% good. And uh, you have to live with the families. Sometimes uh, you are you are more involved, sometimes you are less involved, but most of the time, I think it's very natural. Uh, we are all human beings. And when you deal with the family, sometimes for a couple of years, you are becoming part of their family. They are becoming part of your family. And uh, in many occasions, I I took to, you know, to social meetings, not to uh, 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 something which uh, you don't you don't want your wife to be in. I took my Tammy, my wife, and she came with me, and we were like like a family, and we talked about everything except the the real thing. And uh, on top of all this, uh, there are some people in this business that tells, uh, that told me, and are telling me nowadays, nowadays it's not uh, so actual, that when you deal with the intelligence and when you deal with the ugly business, don't be part of the families. Don't mix between emotions and the ugly things. Now, I believe I was the, the only one who was a mixture uh, because I could uh, I could uh, return from a, from a, a journey to to some somewhere and return at evening time to Israel and uh, I got a phone call from one of the mothers one of the sisters one of the family how are you where have you been what have you done and sometimes you you, you cannot uh, you cannot tell them not because it is secret but because it's uh, it's the beginning of something and you don't want to to grant them too much hopes. You don't want to, to make them to, to sell illusions. So it's a very, very complicated from the, the mental part of your uh, of your work. It's a very, very, uh, very hard, very hard. And you have to, I believe, I believe that uh, uh, you have to work, <clears throat> to work on yourself and to try to differ between the two, the two parts of your emotions and, and feelings. And, uh, you know, it's like a lawyer who is representing somebody. He doesn't like him because he, uh, he killed somebody, whatever. And he knows how to differ this uh, personal from, from the other skills. It's very difficult. I'm, I'm talking now very in a very easy way, but it's very difficult. And another difficult fact that is swirling around the drama is that you're in a democratic country with politics and people are angry at the prime minister and that many people were angry all you know for over a year over the judicial reform plan uh the country was somewhat divided and then this tragedy occurs on october 7th where clearly someone failed more than someone people the system failed at the border i'm just going to say it now you know you don't have to say it in your position if the border security had not failed on saturday october 7th we would be in this mess with the Israeli army now, of course, but, in, in but you know, if you want, if you want to do it uh, in the most uh, practical and most uh, convenient, which is not a word that uh, fits the situation, uh, you you have to keep yourself uh, out of uh, politics. No, I appreciate that, but I but I appreciate that, but I've been hearing from some family members who, of course, have been suffering all this since October seventh, that they're losing patience with the leaders. Right. You have ignored us or betrayed us on October 7th and you're doing it again. Some of them are angry. Some of them. I think that all of them are angry. All of them. Uh, without any uh, differences of. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, of their uh, uh, political views. And uh, I keep myself out of politics because I have to meet the leaders. I have to meet the, the army commanders. I have to meet the secret service people. And I don't want to mix uh, that uh, 
uh, that secret about my uh, political views with the main with the mains. So I put it aside, and I I even tried not to not to be too much involved in the public uh, demonstrations because of that role, mostly in the past. Now, uh, when I when I was less uh, occupied after Gilad Shalit, I could say I could say more, but. Now, when uh, when October seventh uh, occurred, I stopped my. I even I even uh, forgot what I th- thought about the government. It's out of uh, out of my uh, out of my uh, frame now. And for those who are watching, and by the way, we're speaking to Ori Slonim, who for more than thirty five years has been a mediator, a negotiator on behalf of Israeli families, sometimes the Israeli government, Mossad, and military to uh, find. Uh, Israelis who are missing, never a group this big, now helping the families, just for anyone who who tuned in late. You know, when President Biden visited your country, and I know Israelis were thrilled that Joe Biden came and showed such strong support for Israel just a few days after the atrocities of October 7th. Even while he was there, he warned Israel not to act with rage. Of course, you'll be angry and enraged like Americans were, because of 9/11 in the year 2001. So, what's your assessment on the level? What's your assessment on the level of rage in your country, and and and, and how people are reacting? I I, I really think that uh, the the phrase uh, this this phrase has to do anything with our soldiers. They most of them are professionals, even they are not in uh, even if they are reserved, they are very professionals. And they know what happened on that day. They know that uh, they have only one, uh, only one target. They are fighting a terror organization, which is aiming at our borders, which is declaring that we have to be smashed out of th- this ground. So you don't have to be uh, 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 much more than that. They are, they are risking our life. They want us to, to go to hell, to die, whatever. So you don't have to be uh, 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 angry or something, uh, you know, about anything, but just to fight the way you don't, you know, to fight. And I can tell you that uh, I believe, I believe that soldiers are concentrating on their role and less talking about politics. Right, not politics, but there's the overall goal that the leaders of the country set. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu did widen his government. He brought a former chief of staff and defense minister, Benny Gantz. They don't get along politically at all. Um, But he brought Gantz in. Therefore, he has a lot of very sound military advice. And they decided what the stand is. It is to eliminate Hamas, a radical Islamic party that has run the the Gaza Strip since throwing out al-Fatah, the Palestinian Authority. They threw them out in 2007. And that was after Israel left. Israel gave up the Gaza Strip. No settlers, no occupation. Um, in 2005, Israel left. So uh, again, the soldiers get their orders, right? The prime minister, his war cabinet said, we're going to eliminate Hamas. Then the military makes an intelligent plan. What are the specific targets? You mentioned hospitals. Of course, worldwide, there's controversy over army going into hospitals. But Israel says it has evidence that those are among the central Hamas uh, headquarters. And who knows, maybe hostages have been Held there. Israel, so what's your Israel, what's your take on what's your take on all of that that strategy? Israel is not talking about it. Israel is showing in the last uh, three days pictures and clips, and uh, you know uh, uh, heavy heavy uh, documents and and uh, and uh, clips about the fact that uh, in the in the uh, in the you know in the lower in the lower uh, floors. You know, just one floor below the below the people who are there, they found the missiles, they found the ammunition, they found the uh, signs of uh, people who were kidnapped with blood, with a bottle of babies, with everything. So they 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 are they are being hidden uh, below the the usual uh, departments of the hospital. You know, there is a there is a department of uh, all these people who are in the orthopedic cancer, whatever. And five meters below, and sometimes 100 meters below, are uh, an army base of terrorists, a, a center of terrorism. 
No, no place in the world you found it. Well, I got you. You're you're defending the going you into you're defending the entry into hospitals as being necessary as part of a mission. But overall, and I know this is moving away from your work with the families of the kidnapped, except of course that the military mission includes finding the kidnapped victims. So overall, the mission almost impossible or not to eliminate Hamas, the Islamic party there, or you're just eliminating its ability to be the government. Look, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not uh, an army officer in my, in my my uh, present role, and I'm not a politician. Uh, I believe that if you have a, such a cruel enemy who is declaring in public that he wants you to be killed, then you better kill him before. It's a and, biblical thing. It's a uh, biblical thing. Uh, yeah, that I famous quote: "Rise, and, rise and." Go. and Right, I hear you. Rise and kill first if you find someone who's out who's out to kill you. Um, Ori, uh, and by the way, anyone who's viewing, please, uh, and if you're viewing live on Thursday, uh, uh, then, then please you can type questions in, and we will be turning to questions shortly. But I, I have another one for you. Uh, were you ever in a situation as you tried to negotiate for for the release of an Israeli who was being held? possibly the bodies of Israelis who died in Lebanon, maybe held by Hezbollah, by the Iranians. Did you ever have a situation that the Israeli army was at the same time acting with maybe commando operations aimed at rescuing hostages? So you're negotiating and you're also, you know the army is doing things. That, that seems difficult, but that's what's happening now. It's, I believe it's the first, uh, you know, you read my book, you said, and in my book, I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to give a very uh, a very uh, interesting summary because it's uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, 30 35 years uh, about uh, about uh, such uh, negotiations that never occurred within a war. It was uh, within a conflict, you know, with uh, battles here and here and there, but not within a war. So this is uh, this is the difference between nowadays and the other things. And I wrote about uh, about soldiers who were taken into uh, being uh, being taken into uh, being kidnapped or being uh, in, in as prisoner of war or missing in action, which is something which is a big dif has a big difference between this situation that we are talking only about civilians and less about uh, army army commanders army soldiers. So I, I wrote my book only because. Uh, some of my friends from the, the army and the Mossad said that uh, my 30 years of uh, life in this uh, business, it's not a business, but in this area, uh, has, no, uh, has no history uh, written, has no Torah. And I'm the only one who, uh, who knows about everything, but it's not written anywhere. So this is the reason I wrote my book, uh, Anak at the Door. And I published it in Israel, and then I published it uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, my my publisher was uh, Adam Bello, who is the son of Saul Bello, the Nobel Prize uh, one, and uh, and uh, his uh, publications house, uh, 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 Press Hill Post. And uh, what I'm doing now is trying to uh, trying to to ask people to know what is the justification for our way of living. And uh, I hope uh, I hope when you when you read the book you will be influenced and you'll be uh, you see that we are not we are not uh, dreaming every night of uh, killing people. Never. We are it's a, we are, it's a just want to live. Yeah, it's a history of Israel reluctantly going to war when it needs to. Another example, of course, now after October seventh, but so many years after years, and and in any conflict, there often will be some mysteries, some missing in action, some bodies not recovered. In Israel's case, sometimes a kidnapped soldier or two. And I got what you said that often, you no, know, always you were talking about it with the enemy, often through an intermediary after the conflict was over. And so it was almost like an old business. You've been holding this this person for, for, for months, sometimes for years. 
And so sometimes you told me that you had human conversations. It might be the brother of a known Hezbollah terrorist meeting in some third country. You're meeting and you're having a little bit of pleasant, normal conversation. Is that possible even now in a war when babies no. have been kidnapped all the way up to believe. age 87? I don't believe. Yeah. I don't believe. I can tell you that uh, in my meeting for, I think, something like a year with the brothers of uh, Mustafa Dirani, uh, who was responsible to, to the kidnapping of uh, our pilot, Ronald Rad. <clears throat> we talked uh, also about uh, personal things. I told them about uh, about my family. My family is uh, seven generation, 10 generations in Israel, but out of it, seven generation, generations in Hebron. So I'm not, I'm, I'm a real Palestinian. I'm a real Palestinian. My father and my grandfather talked among themselves Arabic. So, you know, some, uh, it, it looks funny, but it's not funny because this is our place and we are not talking about uh, uh, the fact that uh, any day or any, in any day of, uh, of the future, we'll go from here. Here's another tough question. Sometimes I hear also from supporters of Israel here in America, where's the Red Cross? I thought the International Committee of the Red Cross is supposed to get lists of, uh, of hostages and visit them and, and check on their welfare. What, what's your feeling about the Red Cross efforts? I think that the Red Cross, uh, the Red Cross is, uh, is in a, um, they say they are a neutral organization and they, they need the consent of two sides, not only one side. So I think, I think it's a mistake. I think that the Red Cross is a humanitarian organization that should come with the blessing of Western countries, the US and the European countries, and come and see. I can tell you that we let, we let the Hamas in this war for the last 20 days, every day, 100 or 120 uh, trucks entering in a, in a corridor, we call it humanitarian corridor, and brought to, to Gaza lots of equipment from humanitarian points of view. We didn't have one day or one hour of such a corridor. Our people were there without the medicine, without the oxygen, without everything, and no corridor for, for an, a half an hour. So. What else can I say? Israel's been granting the humanitarian corridors and the deliveries because Gaza people, uh, innocent people, you know, are suffering a lack of uh, food, yes, water, medicine. I agree. But, but I got you. And, and just no action at all for the missing 239, 240. Wow. That's not, a until, not until the moment we speak. Yes. Well, uh, let's, uh, I, I have a few more questions, but maybe a lot of you who are watching have written some. Suzanne Borden of Moment Magazine is monitoring the questions and, and would read them. And if we have a chance, we'll come back for a few minutes after questions from viewers. Suzanne? Yes, thank you very much uh, for sharing with us. Um, there's a good question here. Um, assuming that this uh, there's disagreement or conflict between the guiding principles of how Americans versus Israelis deal with negotiations with terrorists, how will this difference be resolved with regard to having both U.S. citizens and others taken? First of all, I believe that uh, at the end of the day, there will be some consent. Uh, perhaps it will be about uh, releasing, you know, groups of uh, groups, uh, parts of this uh, uh, group who is in uh, in Gaza, which I'm against it. I want the whole thing to be to be uh, done in, uh, in one shot, one shot, without any, without any games. But if uh, if our government will end its uh, negotiation with a partially partially release, uh, then I believe that uh, uh, some of them, you know, I believe the babies and the women and the old, the old uh, people will be released before. But my view is that everybody should be released in one group. Thank you. And and that actually goes to a, another question about if they are released, um, 
a few at a time. Is there concern that when the former hostages begin to speak out and talk about their experience and what they saw, does that put the other hostages that are, are still there in harm's way? I believe that those who are responsible for that the process will uh, will know what to do. Thank you. Thank you. I know what that refers to, Suzanne, by the way. You may recall that early in this crisis, uh, for some reason, the terrorists did release uh, two women who were U.S. citizens. They returned to America and the FBI and others uh, advised them, stay quiet. You might just hurt other people if you say anything. And they said nothing in Israel two women were released, and one of them coming out of the hospital after being checked out in Tel Aviv decided that she'd express her anger, and some of it was at Israeli authorities. Um, people didn't like that at all. And so I, I also think the officials will try to make sure that everyone uh, stays quiet for everyone's sake. Uh, you know, there are, there are, there are uh, things that you are allowed to, you are allowed to, uh, to disclose, like, uh, uh, in what conditions you were, what did you, what did you feel? You know, uh, some personal questions should be should be uh, uh, exposed. But uh, I believe that uh, asking about information about others or, or some other situation, I think it will help uh, those who are there. Yeah. Um, how can Qatar be an honest broker to help Israel get the hostages back if they are harboring the terrorists and welcoming them, welcoming them to their country? Every, every, everyone who is uh, the guy that you are describing who will solve the problem is most welcome, but there is no such. There's no one else who can be an intermediary, he's suggesting. Egypt maybe to a degree. Turkey sometimes oh. volunteers. No, Egypt, wants to be a hero. Egypt, is, Egypt is a very, very important country in our region. We are in very good relations with the Egyptian. And uh, they're helping, uh, I believe, in, in most of the cases they're helping. But in the, in the in this occasion, also the Qatar, the Qatar who are who are, who are uh, with the Hamas for many years, uh, they are in the in the picture, and uh, of course your people, the U.S. people. Mm -hmm. Qatar, of course, is in Arabia. Uh, the U.S. military often calls the country gutter. It just the, they can't pronounce the the Q. I, I I suppose. So I've been in Qatar many times, and it is such a mix. It has branches of American and British universities there. And it has, this is important, the largest United States air base in the Middle East. The Uday base is only two hours drive away from the capital, Doha. But it also has the villas and offices of the political wing of Hamas. Other radical groups have been there. It has close relations with Iran. And so Qatar is trying to uh, promote itself as a kind of Switzerland, as though it's neutral and anyone can speak there, anyone can be there. Um, they did not make relations with Israel. They didn't join the Abraham Accords. But in the past, they've had a, a trade office of Israeli business people there. So they are kind of a crossroads of the world. It's not the same as Switzerland because, well, as I said, there's a U.S. air base there. Wow. Um, so it's a strange case. But most U.S. diplomats and military people, when I asked them about Qatar and after October 7th, I asked, shouldn't we just drop them? They're friends of Hamas. And these Americans say... No, we, we need a place to talk. We, we do need it. Do, do you think, Dan, actually, that that will lead to possible uh, relations between Israel and Qatar in, in the future? No, no. Part of Qatar's game in being friendly with the U.S. and Iran is not to go so off track as to also have relations with Israel. So, mm -hmm. no, I don't think they will. Yeah. Um, how much are terrorists around the world taking notes and will we start to see more mass ab um, abductions in other conflicts around the world i really i really don't know i'm i'm so concentrated in our business here now so i uh, I, I don't have a minute to to uh, to try to to make this research i'm sorry I'm, I've been lucky to have a few minutes, if, if I may. Um, well, yes, I, I think it's a very fair concern. Whenever something has worked, quote unquote, for, for terrorists, then other extremists around the world will, will try it, will have copycat violence. If they think that it's easy to use automatic weapons and kill a lot of people at once, all right, we got that. That happens in countries, unfortunately, in the United States, often without any political reason, mass murder. Kidnappings and taking someone across the border, 
Well, it, it's happened to a degree in Africa. Schoolgirls, hundreds of them, were taken hostage by Boko Haram, the Islamic extremists years ago, who then wanted to brainwash the girls and marry them. Um, so it's a technique. What we keep in mind is anyone watching this probably is very involved with Israel. And the reality is that Israel, which celebrated its 75th birthday this year, is an amazing success story. It's a comfortable country where it's on Western standards um, and trying to also be a democratic country, fair to all, but also a high standard of living. And so it's a total shock when someone crosses your border and then is barbaric barrack like the middle ages in killing people and then also the kidnaps in order to make a sophisticated humane country like israel suffer this way they know they've hit israel in one of its real soft places and uh, as i say it's a controversy to be discussed by historians whether israel um has been wise in every way in in striking back and and i know i think ori would say this is not striking back this is the IDF going in with a mission to make sure Hamas never has the power to do this again and also to rescue as many hostages as possible. So that, that's a wholly unjustifiable mission, right? I, I couldn't describe it better than you. Um, if some of the hostages unfortunately die while they are being held hostage, uh, Will we ever be able to uh, get their bodies back? Will uh, they even admit that they had them? Um, or will they just pretend that they were not held captive? We're, we're talking about everybody. We hope he's alive. And if he's not alive, we, we insist to get his body back. Um. Uh, how, I'm going to ask actually two questions. One is, um, how? what is your response to the global pro-Palestinian protests that are discounting um, the hostages? And then also in the United States um, and around the world, Jews have been putting up posters of the uh, hostages. And uh, when we see the spike in anti-Semitism, this is one area where people are going around and uh, pulling them down in the states and um, saying desp despicable things. Um, what is your take on all of that? Uh, I can tell you that first of all, it's not uh, it's not unique for for this period. It's uh, you know it's around the around the around the year. Now it's uh, much more extreme, but I think that it's uh, it's uh, it's one of the main problem of uh, our world. You know this uh, hatred and this uh, misunderstanding and these uh, uh, conflicts, and uh, we have to live with this. Just live with it, Ori. Uh, I mean, again, you're busy with the part of the crisis that you're dealing with and helping families with. But uh, again, I think a lot of people who read Moment magazine or or or, or come into some of our webinars um, know that even diaspora Jews including American Jews, where we have a lot of support, that amazing rally of almost 300,000 people here in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday, showed the political leaders of all parties were there, not just Jews, um, that as this crisis goes on and afterward, there's got to be more effort toward mutual understanding, toward stamping out anti-Semitism, toward more education. Uh, believe me, we, we feel that here, I, uh, I think that this this matter that you are you are talking about is such a huge a huge uh, a problem of uh, of not only the state of Israel but of all the Jew, Jewish community all over the world. But at the same at the same time, uh, if you are talking about the state of Israel, uh, if you are driving if you are driving worldwide. You cannot navigate without our equipment that we have invented. If you want to put your disk on key uh, in the computer, you can't do it if Israel wouldn't invent it. And many, many other things to protect your country from uh, missiles, whatever. So I believe that uh, we don't have to prove too much that uh, we are uh, we are a state uh, we are a state that is very, very important. And I uh, I can tell you, I don't think that in our generation will solve this uh, anti-Semitism problem. But I can tell you that uh, my family, 
were slaughtered in Hebron in 1929. And uh, my wife and myself, we were injured in a terror attack in Tel Aviv. And uh, we are living with this uh, awful situation, but I believe that within the awful situation, we're doing things for all the human beings in the world. Uh, Suzanne Borden, I know you'll join again near the end, but, but if you don't mind, I'll, I'll uh, attack Ori Sloaning with a few more questions. Not really an attack. Um, right, right. Uh, Ori, again, you, you don't want to be enmeshed in, in politics, uh, you know, at present and the choices that Israelis will have to make. Who knows? Maybe there will be an election next year after this crisis subsides. Golda Meir had to resign, felt she had to resign felt she had to, um, about six months after the Yom Kippur War of 1973, um, where mistakes were made and people in Israel didn't realize there'd be a surprise attack by Egypt and Syria. Um, but again, we're staying away from the politics, but a wider sense of politics is, you know, what about the solutions that will mean peace for Israel? You know, whether there should be more reasonable Palestinians who govern in the Gaza Strip. You know, Israel will have to agree to that or be, have a role in that or just occupy the Gaza Strip as Israel did from the Six Day War until 2005. Um, and, and even with what you're hearing from families, because again, I've heard some interviews with some of those families that you spend time with. Um, and some of them uh, think that, yes, we, we have to turn the page and have better neighbors. Yitzhak Rabin said, you can't choose your neighbors. You have to try to make peace with them. Uh, what, what, are, what are you hearing? Uh, I'm hearing, uh, I believe, uh, you know, the number of the, of the human beings whom I'm talking to is the number of the views. And the same number. And the, the, the reason that I am uh, prohibiting myself from entering even now with you uh, regarding politics and, and, and discussions regarding it, that uh, I'm dealing now in the headquarter of uh, 240 families. Can you imagine that I will start to be a, a semi-politician? I believe that half or less than half of the family will say, if you're dealing with politics, please, Ori, don't be with us. We want our, key, our family to be back. This is our only goal. So in that uh, in that time, in that crisis, you you won't hear from me any word regarding politics and regarding the the the, the uh, I think things who are close to it. What I can tell you that I believe that uh, if our neighbors will accept the fact that we can live together, I will be the first one to join. But as they don't want it for the time being, uh, we we have to. Uh, we have to not to accept it, but to fight it. Uh, now, by the way, we understand that some of the missing people, the hostages, the people kidnapped from 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 southern Israel into Gaza on October seventh, um, are from Nepal and Thailand. Farm workers who had jobs in Israel yes. have their families and governments been involved to some degree. For sure. For sure, but they don't. Uh, they don't need to do it via Israel. They can do it directly with the with the U.S., with the Qatar, with the Egypt. And the only thing that uh, we are we are aiming with these people is first of all, they are working in our uh, fields. They are taking care of our old people, and we care for them. But uh, regarding the negotiation, they have more powers than the Israelis. And uh, again, as we said, there are U.S. citizens among the hostages. So no wonder the United States government is involved in Qatar and Egypt and perhaps elsewhere. I'm sure in a friendly way with Israel and its crisis. But understandably, each government puts its citizens first, right? It's, I believe that uh, every country has uh, only one obligation within this agreement is to take care of their uh, citizen wherever they are. And when somebody Israeli is being kidnapped uh, some, somewhere in Africa or somewhere in, in uh, wherever, the state of Israel will come to, to rescue him. Uh, let me One get last to thing, uh, oh, if I may, it's, just, it's really a, a last thing, if I may. Although you favor an overall deal in which all hostages would be released and if necessary, Israel 
would release a massive number of prisoners because you'll take care of that problem later. That's pretty much what you said. If there are partial releases, still that has to be welcome because every life saved will, will be great news. I accept it. I accept it, but, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm dealing now with uh, with a bunch bunch of uh, great people uh, who uh, should be released, all of them. And uh, if I if I will tell you that I prefer some group of these people, I believe that I I miss my point. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We'll just uh, wrap up with uh, just a couple more questions from the audience. Um, will any kind of an exchange of prisoners will that cause danger to Israel in the future for their security? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Um, and also, in terms of the hostage families, I mean. There are so many, and there are lots of families who are very vocal, at least here in the United States. We keep seeing the same families, um, but we don't know much about all of the families. And does that have an impact on if they're releasing people uh, slowly, how much um, is known about these people to the outside world? Like, should we be hearing more about the other families, uh, family members that are being held hostage? First of all, some families are are traveling to the US, some of them are traveling to Brussels, some of them to Paris, some of them to London. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's also a, a matter of, uh, if somebody is, uh, is Spanish, he should go to Spain. If somebody is, is British here in Israel, his sources are here in British, he will go. And also a matter of uh, languages and many, many reasons for that. Great. Um, well, at this time, I think we need to uh, wrap up things. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to share with our audience. Um, I know this is something that is uh, everybody is watching very closely, um, and I appreciate for your time. Uh, is there any other th anything else you'd like to share with us? Final point, Ori. Yeah, I have many finance points. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, we are uh, we, are, we we thank a lot. To the, whole, to the people of the U.S. who are uh, who are very, very close friends of our country. Uh, we know that they have uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, obligations towards others, but I think that uh, the friendship between these two countries is great, even if, some, even if sometimes you have, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, this, this uh, agreement, it's okay, it's also in, in our houses and uh, in our families, but uh, we are very great, grateful for that uh, for that uh, assistance and friendship. And uh, I uh, I came here to this interview uh, to to tell you about also about my book, which uh, I'm not having any profit out of my book. Mm -hmm. I, I all my income from this book is going to my charity variety in Israel and going to special kids to who are Israelis, Arabs, Druze, Cherkes, and I don't have a penny out of my book. So read my book. Great. And again, his uh, Ori's book is A Knock at the Door. I've put a link in the chat so people can access it. We will be sending a follow-up email and I will include the link uh, to the book. And or if you want to send me uh, the, the name and a link to the uh, organization you just mentioned, I will include that and send that to everyone as well. It's very simple. It's a variety Israel. Okay, great. Thank you. Again, if somebody, if somebody would like to be generous and help the kids of Israel, which are not only Jews, as I told you, they are Arabs, Palestinian, Jewish, Druze, and Czechs, I will be more than happy. And if if they will approach you, I will send you the link to this organization. Great, thank you, Dan Ori. Thank you very much, Ori. Thank you for all that you are doing, and we will see everybody next time. Please go to momentmag.com. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.